Take me back to 1973, um, the time around this festival. Why did people want to escape the cities? A disillusionment and desire and, and pragmatics. I guess a cross-section of, of the community, particularly young people who were disillusioned with the way society was going. You know, we'd had the Vietnam War. Um, they felt that society was too money-driven and conservative and so on. So they desired to live in other ways. And where are you going to do that? Well, the pragmatics came in in that the northern rivers, the dairy industry had fallen over, banana plantations had fallen over, the land was, was cheap. And then the Aquarius Festival happened and it kind of catalyzed it. And that's when, Carly, you're, you decided to stay, is that right? Oh, security in numbers, of course. We all <laughs> moved to the same region. Lee, what was the motivation, though, I mean, from your perspective, uh, as a, I suppose as a historian in this aspect, yeah. to build their own houses? What was the genesis for the growth of, of these, these sort of self-building communities? For some, it was about that living communally. So that's where the multiple occupancies emerged because people were wanting to experiment with collective forms of living that they weren't able to do elsewhere and also more of an emphasis for other people was just to live autonomously, to not be systems dependent, to be off the grid and to be more sustainable, although the word wouldn't have been used so much at that point. And was there a significant building experience in, in at that time, do you think, Lee? Again, it was a real range because some, some of the people that went up there were architecture dropouts, um, trained as architects or, or architecture students. Um, others were yeah, completely naive. So you had a real range of experiences. Okay. What were the sorts of structures that we could see in this area? Initially, uh, lots of tents and caravans and <laughs> pole structures and so on. Um, moving into when people started to build themselves more permanent homes, uh, the domes, mud brick housing, um, stabilised earth. The domes were often ferro-concrete, timber, a lot of timber that was taken from site, early um, experiments in recycling and, and salvaging. Okay. So the salvaging of whole buildings that were then recomposed and reassembled as houses. All right. You're living in a dome which you built in, in at this time as well. What does your dome look like? It's a ferrous cement shell. It's on top of a cliff. It's, it's in turpentine forest, old turpentine forest. It doesn't have a road. It's invisible from the air. So it's using a site that was of no value, which is something we'd learnt possibly from Sydney. Don't do anything on valuable real estate. And also we we're trying to keep off agricultural land because we didn't have much of it. It was a, a very steep and infertile valley and gardens were precious. And why build a dome? What was the motivation for that for you? Uh, in a forest, things fall down from above. <laughs> it's strong and it doesn't burn terribly well because it's a cement shell. Also, I didn't need to know much building. Ah, so you built this yourself? Everybody built everybody's house in the particular yes, region I was at. Right. Um, I was influenced by several people from the Rushcutter Bay Cruising Yacht Club, actually. Why is that? Oh, because they had the, the yachting experience yes, and yachting the rigging experience. experience. And ferrous cement hull experience. Okay. It was quite a fashion at that time. <laughs> um, Erwin, what about for you? Because I know that you are an architect mm. and you moved to this area in, in the late 1970s as well. We actually uh, loved the rainforest area and we seriously uh, wanted to uh, learn how to design passive solar buildings for the subtropics. You can extend the range that Lee talks about from just disillusioned and dropout. It actually extends to people who were altruistic and believed in uh, designing better cities. We were working in Sydney on the Glebe during the Whitlam years. We're actually uh, trying to uh, create uh, functional communities. And we're very serious about it. It wasn't just sex, drugs and rock and roll. <laughs> we were actually trying to build a future for our children. Did you think that you were doing something very different, though, at the time? Yes, of course. But our experience included living in Melanesia, Polynesia, New Guinea, Indonesia, and uh, co-building uh, wedding houses in Vanuatu and documenting that as a research thing. So architecture is a very broad range mm. and, and uh, our influence uh, was with Indigenous people and it moved us away from mainstream North Sydney 
architecture practice. How did the community get together? Did everybody drag well, building materials around? We supported around? each other. 10, 20 people would get together and poles were very accessible in uh, a lot of uh, durable hardwoods. So starting you'd network with your neighbours and a big day would be arranged and everyone would come with their gear and knock a few chickens on the head and a few beers and in a day you'd have the, the structure would be up with 20 people. It's sort of like a barn raising. Mm. How long did it take to build your dome, Carly? Ah, it took about a year of meshing and weaving of the steel and then a great big spaghetti day happened and 18 people turned up and yep. threw 10 tonnes of mortar all over it. And, and it's there standing today? Yes. For some, the dome had a, that space had a, a spiritual content to it, that it was a space of the universe. In a less spiritual way, it was also just, it wasn't square. You know, sometimes, quite literally not square. Yeah, quite yeah. literally not square, but also not square in the sense of being too conservative. So for some people, if you were going to move into this area and do things differently, you didn't want to just build yourself an A-frame yeah. chalet. But also structure. it was the, the lectures and, and mm. the work of Buckminster Fuller. Yeah. Well, and, and he actually, I don't spent we? a day with him in 1970 at Sydney Uni and he was inspirational, so he blew our socks off. Mm. He was 80-year-old with a bullet bald head and he just spoke like a machine gun and we were hung on to every word. It was just amazing, his concept of minimal space, great yoga spaces, <laughs> you know, meditation That's spaces. That's a good point. But each house that you assisted with, you helped build, you learnt more and more. So you shared building techniques, yes. you shared ideas. But How did those ideas get shared around, Carly? What was, what was oh, it? A straight experience of seeing other yeah. people build things and it, get things right and get things wrong. And you it was went called on. participatory design academically where you collaborate and you do experiential learning and you, and you learn on the job. Even if you think you're professional and you've got um, knowledge, you actually have to start again and work with the materials at hand because we used uh, uh, mostly recycled and on-site materials. So we were actually experimenting with local materials, uh, on-site materials, rather than going, like now, going to a big warehouse and getting a semi-load of materials. Describe your home, Erwin. Well, the river house is an octagon with a mezzanine and the roof, we actually experimented with uh, shingles in a forest that had fire hazard and we ended up learning how to do ferro-concrete very well. We helped other people learn how to do it because you could mould the gutters and shapes and it was free form. You couldn't experiment with it. You experiment on the dunny, you know, and then you work <laughs> on the house. So and we experiment on ourselves and then <laughs> other people. So it was all experimental. And it was lovely to be able to work in the round and off out of sight of the out square. Out of sight. What about the reactions from the local community? What was happening there at the time? Oh, it's a nightmare. <laughs> Mm. harassed by, well, terrified of the police and the council. And the corporate body was trying to get everybody to make things as low-key as possible mm. so as not to draw fire. We had demolitions and we had in major police invasions and it was all quite nasty. And, and what about things like even getting the power on and plumbing and for it to well, all we do were standards? Off the grid. Yeah, okay. Building inspectors and planners uh, got on very well with them because essentially you needed to deal with structure, safety and health. And uh, if you get that, well detailed and well, they actually liked the fact that you were innovative. The area that was difficult was um, proving to them that dry composting toilets and reed beds and water management systems that weren't traditional were healthy and we had to prove that. So we set precedents there and they thought you could only do that on 100 acres in the bush. If they're built well, they actually are sustainable. Well, I, I came to the project because I had been um, doing work on, I guess, alternative architecture practices, contemporary alternative architecture practices, and realising that this stuff had been happening at our own doorstep in the 60s and, and into the, the 70s. The more that I researched, the more interesting I found the material and the more admiration that I came to have for the people that actually did it. It required so much dedication, so much time and, and effort. Um, and these people w were really, yeah, kind of path-breaking um, in terms of sustainable building practices. Mm. Defining moment was trekking up the side of the hill barefoot 
um, through the mud to reach Carly's dome, which was our <laughs> first visit. That's pretty special. It, it's certainly worth a look at. And I do thank my guests for joining me here on By Design. It's wonderful to meet you. Lee Stickles, Erwin Weber and Carly McLaughlin, thank you so much for coming in and dropping by. Thanks oh, for having me. Your world unfolding.